Hello and welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, the community. This community is full of developers, distro maintainers, uh, Linux personalities, everyday users. Each one plays a big role in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. Join me now as we turn the spotlight on. I'm your host, Rocco, and our special guest today is my friend, Zebedee Boss. How are you, Zebedee? Hiya. Um, I'm good. Hiya. Getting excited to do this. <laughs> I am super excited to do this. And you had to be the first person <laughs> that I interviewed. You had to be. All right. You are Zebedee Boss. You are known as PZ, Producer Zeb, for people that don't know. Um, so... Let's lay some of the groundwork for who you are. Who is Robert Wood, the man, personally? Um, right. This this will come into three sections. So, firstly, I'm a husband, um, and I've been lucky enough to be married to my beautiful Janice for 39 years, um, and we'll have our 40th anniversary next year, and we're going to celebrate by going to Australia, somewhere that we've always wanted to go to, um, and it'll be an opportunity to see my sister, um, who moved out there about 12, 15 years ago. So we're really looking forward to that. Secondly, um, I'm a father and a grandfather. Um, and my two children, Mark and Nicola, have blessed us with five grandchildren so far. And it's truly magical. That is awesome. Yeah, it, it's it's I, I can't put into words how much how much joy it brings to me to know that life goes on. It's fantastic. Um, and then finally, um, I'm just a bloke from South London who grew up in the 60s and 70s. My mum did a fantastic job bringing the four of us up, even though my father died when I was 11. So she did us proud. Thank you, mum. <laughs> definitely and unfortunately she's not with us now she passed away about three years ago bless all right uh do you have any hobbies then outside of linux um i think you probably have to go back about 40 years um when i was really passionate about playing badminton um and i took part in a, a local league and for for many years we were able to progress our way up through the divisions and get to division three now people are thinking oh division three that's not very high but let me tell you division two and division one was when you started getting into county standards and, and i'm guessing that's the equivalent of your state standards um and internationals and the the difference in the level of play was was scary we would be going along to competitions and winning I don't know. You play, you play the best of nine games, and sometimes we would win 6-3, and so other times we would win 5-4. You get to the next division, we was losing every game 9-0. <laughs> we were just <laughs> getting mashed. Now, people think that badminton is actually quite an easy game. You just sit in front of a, uh, a net, and you just pit a pat in with this shuttlecock thing. Right. Um, but actually, I used to take great delight in taking really good tennis players and really good... Do you guys call it squash over there or is it racket? Uh, you know, it's racquetball. You, racquetball, is it? Yeah. I used to take them to pieces, not that because they weren't any good, but because they didn't realise that badminton was such a physically exhausting game. Now, yes, racquetball squash is very hard, but you're confined in a square and you can't run around too much because you tend to hit the wall if you don't stop. Right. Whereas with badminton, you physically have to run the whole width and the length and the depth of the court. And sometimes it's quicker to run big round in a circle and come back again than stop and, and turn around. But I eventually had to give it up because I was going on court with so many neoprene joints that I, my hips, knees, ankles and knees just gave up. Yeah, it's it happens to everybody, man. Mm -hmm. So that... That's, I guess, the only real hobby I've had 
outside computing. All right. Um, what do you do for your day job? Um, I'm a software tester. <laughs> so I'm sat in front of the computer for eight hours a day. Really? That yeah. is so awesome, dude. So like uh, your daily workflow, like you're just basically taking software and just testing it out as a user or what? Um, well, we've got, I work for an organization that's probably got somewhere in the region of about 1500 employees and there's maybe between 120 and 150 applications, but there's probably the eight or nine core applications that the whole business has to use. Now, one of the things we can't have is we can't have an update come down from our provider. We just put it out to the business and all of a sudden you can't take payments. You can't send out letters. You can't look up information. So what we have to do is we have to test it from a system point of view. Does it all still do what it's supposed to do? And then we have to prepare tests for what we call our end users, i.e. people within the business, to come along, sit down, do their day-to-day -day job, and prove to themselves and their managers that it's still working. And that's probably the longest part um, because each of the scripts has to – because I'll give you an example. We went through a massive change about a year ago where the company just decided to completely change all the screens. So we then had to uh, design a set of scripts. Yeah, because instead of it being here, it was now you know over here. And instead yeah. of being something up here, it was – so we, we had literally had to rewrite every script that says, if you click on the word file – do you get the following drop down in the list? Then we would have, and let's say there were 10 items. We would then have to click on the first one and say, and do you then see this on your screen? Right. Go back to the second one. So if you can imagine there's, I don't know, 15,000 clicks that you can do in this wow. application. It, it took us about six months just to write the scripts. Jeez, oh man. Yeah, Thank so you for changing testing. that around. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just about, testing the software it's as you rightly said making sure that the end user knows that it's going to work properly okay so we know about your day job we know about your hobbies we know you love linux how did you get the name zebedee boss how did you become known as that um well it's interesting i guess when i first went onto the internet you know what it's like. You go to try and choose an email address and everything you want is is taken. Everything. Um, absolutely, yeah. So at that particular time, and this is this is just a a um, the the first reason I chose a name. It's not Zebedee Boss, but it's leading up to it, yeah? Yep. So I used to work on London Transport, which is uh, as a bus driver. And we used to have a wonderful canteen, and one of the meals that they would ser serve up is – Sausage, egg, bacon, chips, and beans. So I thought, email address, SEBCB2. Why two? Because I used to eat it twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got an email address, sebcb2 at hotmail.com. Um, but then I joined the point-to-point -point community and was a, a, a naughty boy for a couple of years. Wait, is um, that hotmail address still active? <laughs> sebcb2 at hotmail.com. Yes, it is. And it's <laughs> probably... 10,000 spam and two legitimate right. <laughs> emails that come through. So a lot of the time it's just empty spam, empty spam. It's just crazy. So one day we all got bored with our current names and we said, we decided to just pick characters from a TV show and we ummed and ahed, And then we thought of a children's TV show called the magic roundabout. And one of the characters in there was Zebedee. And he would come at the end of the show on a big giant spring jump over the fence and go, boing, time for bed, children. <laughs> and I thought, that'll do. I'll become Zebedee. But, of course, try and get an email address, zebedee at gmail.com. Yeah. Doesn't exist. So I used to have a wonderful email address called theboss at aol.com. And, of course, theboss at gmail.com just wasn't there. Right. Because it was, it was gone. So I thought, I oh, know what, zebedeeboss at gmail.com. So that's, and it's just stuck ever since. And most people end up calling me Zeb. I love how it all came together. Zebity balls. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Before we get into Linux itself, I'd like to take you back to the beginning of your computer days. Um, what was and when was the first time you touched a computer? 
I'm guessing we're going to have to go back to around about 1981 when I convinced my mum to buy me a BBC Micro. Um, and this was a computer made by the Acorn Computer Company, and it was sponsored by the BBC, which is the main television um, network within the UK for watching TV back in the day. And they were, they were wanting to get a computer into every home, even back then. And more importantly, they wanted to get computers in schools that children could learn to program. So this BBC Micro was a very simple machine that ran BBC Basic, and you could do all sorts of various bits and pieces on it. Um, so I'm guessing that was my first computer that I bought or that my mum bought and then I got to play with. So like right now, if somebody asked you, would you consider yourself to, or maybe let's start back then, would you consider yourself to have a technical background or you just like an everyday user? Um, I'm definitely an everyday user because technical and Zeb simply don't go together in the same conversation. I have to disagree, dude. Even, <laughs> no, even no, no, as no, no. long as I've known you, you you come up with uh, scripts to put into the computer. You're editing Grub. You are – wait. You work on software on your day job. Tell me you're not a technical <laughs> user. Come on. <laughs> no. Um, I know what the end user needs. Yeah, because I am an end user. And I, and I realized way, way back in the day when I sat there for 45 minutes typing all this code into this BBC Micro, and then it would come up, ah, syntax error. What do you mean syntax error? I just spent 45 minutes <laughs> typing this. And you'd have to go back and look for a question mark or a semicolon or parenthesis, not in the – and I thought, really? Nah. And that was, I guess – Oh, I suppose you could call it my first next, but not really because it wasn't about an operating system. But I decided I'm not doing this coding malarkey. I'm just going to be um, an end user and become good at it. So I've, I've learned how to do certain stuff. But for me, a technical person who is somebody who you could give them a manual, give them a wiki, they could read it, do it once, and they understand it. I have to do it 15, 20 times before it suddenly sinks in. Well, then I'm lower than an end user because it takes me more than that. <laughs> um, so, computers, when did you first hear the word Linux? So, it was interesting because I'd just done a, a very similar um, discussion with someone, and I'd always thought it was about 2008, 2009, when I first got my ubuntu account set up mm -hmm. and i think back in the day it was ubuntu one or something yep um not not version one but they used to call the account ubuntu the single one. sign on ubuntu one yeah. that's the one yeah and then i was thinking now hang on a minute because i wasn't working at my previous company where all these technical guys were so in reality it was probably around about 1998 to 1999 and I was working for a company that were, and we were using Novell and Linux. And I guess not Linux, but Unix rather. Right. And I guess the only command that I can remember back from Unix is a really bad one. And it's like kill space minus nine, because you can then kill any processor you want running. Right. Um, and we were slowly moving over to the Microsoft side of things, but there was some really, really clever guys there that were doing amazing things with Orc and Grep. And they said to me, yeah, look, you need to try this Linux stuff. It's going to be really, really good. So, yeah, about, about 19, 19, 1998, 1999, around about that time. And that's basically what intrigued you to try it out for yourself. Um, I wouldn't say intrigued because I, I, I didn't realize I was going to become interested in them. But I thought, hey, well, you know, these guys are doing it. They're doing some really clever stuff. Why not give it a go? So you just say, give it a go, and no fear in trying it, or you just jumped right in? Um, no, because back then I, I, I knew no fear. I was young and silly, and again, I've always been of the opinion that, yes, I have a computer, but it's not the be-all and end-all if I break it. It's not the end of the world if I haven't got a computer because I've mucked up the operating system or anything. So I've always been... Um, adventurous in in that way so i sat down and they said right this is how you install it 
I went, stop. Not happening. <laughs> <laughs> no way am I going to learn all that stuff with you guys not sat next to me and I'm not bringing in so... No, I, 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 I didn't bother back then. There was no way I was going to go near it. So, so there was the a time one, frame that you, when you first heard it to when you actually tried it? Ten years. Ten years. Um, and I eventually tried it when Wooby yep. came out for, for Windows, which was about 2008. And they said, well, I tell you what, you, we've been trying to get you for years to use this Linux, but now you can install it on Windows. And if you don't like it, you can uninstall it. All from, I went, I'll have some of that. Went home, put it on there, installed it, started playing around with it. And it was like, what? How is anybody supposed to understand what is going on? And that was definitely my first next. <laughs> Uninstalled within two hours. <laughs> and that was it. I never, I never touched it again um, for years. All right. So, um, but there, there's some cons. Give me some pros to that first experience. There had to be something that was good about it, right? It didn't look like Windows. And you could mess around with the configuration you could get it to look how you wanted it to and, and and back then i was always trying and i've forgotten the names now and i should have looked them up but there was a load of programs that you could install on top of windows i think rainmaker was one of them or something and then there was uh, a company that bought out something called fences and all sorts yep. of stuff where you could change i had fences yep. <laughs> yeah but it wasn't as good as the way Linux could make it look. Um, and although it was initially, oh, this is rubbish, I had gone in and changed a few things, and I thought, oh, this this is actually not too bad. And then I started to do a bit of things a bit more complicated, and that's when the first next statement came out. Um, and I was so frustrated back then that I actually um, coined the phrase, for me, to understand true frustration, one must only go so far as to install Linux. <laughs> that's not a good tagline for the Linux communities. Ever. It isn't, but it, that's that's what, that's what I was back in 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 two two thousand and eight. But I'll agree that that's what it was back then. Back mm -hmm. then, that's what it was. Yeah. So I went. I immediately went back to my comfort zone, which was Windows. Um, and I'm guessing it was probably Windows 2 or very close to Windows 286 at that time. Um, and for me, it just felt very easy and intuitive to use. All right. So there was that 10-year period. What made you want to try Linux again? Um, because I'd made this little ditty about Linux and didn't want that to be my final, you know, entrance or the, the finale of going into Linux because I said that Linux meant learn to speak geek or die trying. Um, the, the I part of Linux was it's inexplicable only for those people with abnormal thought processes. Um, N not for the faint hearted. U universally accepted that the program you want to work won't work unless you spend hours in forums with a geek. And then Xenophobia. You will soon be exhibiting xenophobic traits if you stick with this. And we're, we're PG friendly, so I won't go on with the rest of that statement. <laughs> and I thought, do you know what? This is wrong. This is not. Somebody has spent hours and years developing this piece of software. So I need to get back into it um, and try and get this to work. And I'm guessing it was 2011, 2012. Um, when I when I started to to try it again and thought, oh, this is better than I tried before, I might be able to stick with this. So I guess I was thirty percent Linux, seventy percent Windows back then. Okay, um, do you consider yourself now, now that you've been in Linux for so long? Do you consider your? I know the answer to this question, but for people who don't, do you consider yourself a distro hopper? One hundred percent. And um, give me a guess, Zeb, how many Linux distros or desktop environments you've tried in the years you've been distro hopping? How many are on DistroWatch? <laughs> and then 
and then probably treble it because I went beyond distro watch and I try everybody who says, Oh, this is not, I'll have a look at that and I'll go in and try it because I love trying to find out if there's anything out there as good as my distribution of, of choice. Um, but, but going back to the, am I, am I, do I distro hop? Um, the phrase hopatitis was coined by a PC NetSpec in the Peppermint um, forums, mainly due to me forever posting, oh, have you tried this distro with screenshot? Have you tried this distro? Have you tried this distro? Um, and in the end, he got so fed up with it. He said, you know what? You, you suffer from hepatitis. In fact, I'm going to submit that to the Urban Dictionary. And he did, and it was accepted. So so we can look up the Urban Dictionary and find hepatitis, and it's all because of Zeb. All because of PC NetSpec. <laughs> Because I drove him, and that's Mark Grease for people who don't understand from the peppermint side of you. I drove him crazy with constantly f- throwing up screenshots of, and then because once I'd done it, everybody thought, "Oh, this is okay. I'm going to do it." And so there was a little flurry back in 2015, 2016, where everybody was trying something else. So yeah, he 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 coined that phrase. Okay, so. Again, I know the answer to the que- this question, and I think most people do, but for those that don't, what distro desktop environment did you finally land on after years of distro hopping? Well, it's actually quite interesting because before I found Peppermint, I didn't distro hop that much, as strange as it seems. Um, I guess I was I was on for an equal amount of time, um, Ubuntu, Kubuntu, Linux Mint, LMDE, Solid XK, and PC Linux OS. Those were the only ones that I had tried back in the day. Um, and then in mid-2015, I found Peppermint 6. Not quite sure why I went to Peppermint 6. It must have been some sort of video I'd seen or some distro review that I'd read, and I thought, oh, that looks different. I'll, I'll go and... Give that a try. And it was quite strange that when I first got there, I thought, oh, I don't like this menu. It was the old LXDE menu, which was very flat and non-informative and there was no search. Um, And I thought, you know what? I'm probably going to hop again. But then I thought, no, let's just do what you've been doing, trying things for two or three months. And then I got to meet the community who were, so friendly and so responsive to a new user's questions that I thought, hey, I like this. I can I can live with these people. I can work with these people every day. And that's why I stayed, because primarily um, of the forums. Don't get me wrong. Peppermint 6 was lightning fast and everything just worked. But even back then, it was starting to be the people more than the, the software. Yep. The community. Absolutely. All right. Do you still use uh, Windows or Mac in any way? Like, are you a a filthy dual booter, as Ryan would say? Um, I am 100% a filthy dual booter, (laughs) um, purely and simply because no one else in my family uses Linux. And I am that guy that everyone goes, oh, Rob will know. Give Rob a phone call. So if I don't keep up with Windows, then I'm not going to be able to – to, to help them but if i'm brutally honest yeah i don't dislike it i'm not an automatics window hater because i'm a linux user yeah it's functional it works and it did me proud from about 1985 until 2015 when i when i was well, 16 maybe when i finally started using linux 95 percent of the time well look we and you always have these conversations you use what you works best for you for that particular task. So, mm-hmm. so. And let's face it, there are simply some Windows games that don't work on Linux. There are, and that's why I'm a filthy dual booter too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about your daily workflow, um, software. and So like you do a fresh install of Peppermint. What is the first software you install and like that you got to have? Okay, well, let's just first of all go back to the workflow um, side of things because seriously, what is this workflow you speak of? I've never understood 
the concept. Oh, my workflow doesn't fit with GNOME. My workflow doesn't fit with KDE. Um, I hear it all the time and I'm like, huh? Because I use a mouse. I use keyboard shortcuts. I use the mouse when I should be using keyboard shortcuts. And I use the keyboard shortcuts when it's obvious that using a mouse should be better. So I'm really fickle in how I use a computer and what I do. So if I do have a workflow, I'm not aware of it. I just, you know, I just don't get, I've never been somebody who understood the need to use the buzzwords. Yeah. Right. Um, So, you know, people will say, you mean you're a real person. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) No, I've just always been, hang on a minute. You just said that. What do you mean? And then they explain what they mean. I said, well, why didn't you say that in the first place? What's all this nonsensical big words you're coming up with? And I know workflow is not a big word, but the phrase workflow encompasses so many things. That it does. I don't think you can just sum it up as workflow, but that's just me. So I don't, I don't think I have a workflow because I use so many different methods. The only thing that I can say is you will never get me using i3. I just Ryan's don't working on that. Get it. Ryan's working on that. He will be a very old gray man in a pine box. <laughs> and I would have been there years before him. I've tried it. it no, it's not it for everybody, dude. It's not for Absolutely everybody. Absolutely not. But software, now that's another, another thing entirely. I am a very simple person. So once I get to know something, I've got to have it on all of the distros that I go to. So, KDE, I don't care. I want GNOME Terminal. Yeah. KDE, I don't use KDE parted. parted. I want G parted because it's what I grew up with. Yeah. Right. So if I was to list them all, there's probably 20 and it sings like G parted, GNOME Disk Utility, GNOME Terminal, GIMP, GPIC, SM Player, Jack D. Oh, Jack D, you say. I didn't know you was that clever with, with audio. I'm not, but. There was a time when I was playing with being a DJ and I was on Kubuntu at the time and I was forever frustrated with KDE not allowing me to to do two things at one time with audio. So there's a very simple thing that you can use Jack D for and that is to say only allow something to take over the sound 99% of the time. And that 1% allows you to jump in and use another application at the same something that windows just does. Yeah. Right. I could be watching VLC. I could be running, um, audacious and playing music. And then I could open up YouTube and watch a video and windows goes, yeah, you can have all of that all at the same time. Back in the day, Linux never used to be like that. So I learned a little bit about Jack D. Um, and then I must have numbs lock cause I hate, cause my, my password is just, Four numbers. Hey, really secure, yeah? But as I've, as I've said before on a show, if someone can actually get into my house, into my room, and onto my computer, you're welcome to it. I think yeah? they'll see so, the baseball bat first. Just saying. It's, it's, it's in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, because I'm predominantly on um, Ubuntu-based distros, um, I have to have things like Build Essentials, LM Sensors, P-Sensor, Synaptic, Recently, I've started to add things like glances, dark table. Um, for the terminal, as I said before, I'll use GNOME terminal, but then I like NeoFetch and uh, INXI. Um, and what was the other one? ScreenFetch? Yep, ScreenFetch. Um, and then for me right now, I must have Telegram and I must have OBS Studio um, and obviously Steam. So those are, those are the things. And I've got a little script now that it's not really a script. I know how to install stuff in different distros. So I'll go sudo pacman minus s, copy, paste, go. And it just goes away and installs every single one of those articles. And where I make the mistake, and most places don't do build essentials, I'll then just retype it or use the app arrow, take out build essentials, and then run it again. I haven't yet gone to the extent of what Ryan has done I made a little script for each type of package manager that that's there. Right. Well, that's a little in depth. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
All right. Um, you just mentioned all of the software and Linux it has been growing their software availability for years. And it's to a point now where it's pretty awesome. But is there any software that's currently not available on Linux that you would like to see? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a product by a company called Void Tools and it's called Search Anywhere. And if you've ever used it on Windows, um, give it five minutes, maybe even two minutes for the average computer, and then you will get instantaneous search result. Before you have finished typing the word Michael, it has already filtered every single word that's got Michael in it, ready for you to pick what you want. It is blisteringly fast. Now, I know... Linux has catfish and mlocate and locate and all the rest of them. But when you present it with a 50 terabyte database of information, A, it can't build that index in 10 minute like search anywhere can. And even when it has built it and it only takes about half an hour for update DB to finish, you then type what you want, click search, and then you have to wait three or four minutes before the first sort of search results. Yep. And I'm sure that there must be a quicker way to search in Linux. But at the moment, I've I've not found it. And I know from the terminal, mlocate and a word, and you can find it. But I'm, I'm a point and click person. I just like to be able to type it into a GUI and it comes up with my answer. Well, it's nice that we can use those terminal commands to do these things, but it would also be nice to have a GUI for everybody else who doesn't want to use the terminal. Yeah. So because I haven't got search anywhere, my go-to is catfish. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Yes, it is. Um, so, you know, we talked about the software you use. You, you know, you have your YouTube channel, which, mm -hmm. you know, obviously is you being a maniac running over <laughs> caravans. Um, but what would you say you use Linux for the most? Is it um, out of necessity? Is it your hobby? Is it gaming? What, what is it that you use it for? Well, I certainly don't use it at work because we're just starting to roll out Windows 10 and Azure servers and Office 365. Um, but for me, Linux is my relaxation. Yeah. I don't need to have a computer working because I've got to get an email written or I must have this piece of work or I'm writing my thesis or something. Um, and as strange as it may seem, I work on a computer eight hours all day long and it's on this little desk behind me. It sits there with my laptop and the monitor. And I literally, when I finish work, I go like this, I shut it down and I go, right, now time to relax. And I sit here and I distro hop. Um, and I install software and I play games and I stream and I talk to my friends around the world all because of Linux, but I don't have to have it because I've got to get stuff done. I do it because I love messing with computers and multiple monitors and trying new things out. And it's my relaxation as strange as it may be. And as frustrated as I can get with Linux, four hours in front of the machine, I'm just chilled. Great. Right, I'm ready to go to bed. I love it. Well, that pretty much answers my next question, which is, you know, what would draw, what drives your love of Linux? You know, you mentioned those things, but you know, some people do it for the flexibility. Some people do it because they can customize like we talked about um, some for the openness and some for the community. So what do you think the major one for you is? It's a simple one word answer. Community. Yeah, yep. nothing needs more to be said. If Windows had such a community, I would not be on Linux because I'm a people person. Yeah, um, I'm not a deep thinker, so I have no esoteric mindset. Um, I know what I know, or I think I do. I know what I like, and I simply do it. Is it flexible, customizable, open? I don't know. And to be honest, I don't care. It works. I use it. I enjoy it. Very nice. All right. So we know that, you know, Linux is uh, not problem free. You're going to mm -hmm. run into issues. What do you think the most uh, exciting or maybe the hardest problem you ever solved in Linux and like, 
how did that make you feel when you were able to do that? I guess it's I now understand partitioning. I don't know in the early days how many times I hosed my Windows install because I got partitioning wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not an expert, yeah? But I know that I need a 512 meg partition with the boot flag set for UEFI to boot. Um, whether people think you should or shouldn't have, I know to set up a two gig swap file. We know whether you has that as a swap file or a swap partition. I don't care if you've got a thread ripper with 64 gig of RAM. Everything I've read says you really should have a swap file or a swap partition just in case. Um, and going back to the Peppermint community, there's two guys on there, PC NetSpec and a guy called Vin DSL. We all call, just call him Vin Diesel because it's easier. They know more about Linux than I'll ever know in my lifetime. Anybody comes on, yep, you must have a swap partition. You must have a swap file. Don't care how great your computer is. So I understand that now, and I understand how to partition things. As long as I'm looking at it visually, Jason Evangelo is doing an arch challenge. Yep. And he wants everybody to install arch the arch way. I get to the bit about partitioning and I'm suddenly like, oh, which one of these four one terabyte drives has got my OSs on? <laughs> which, because it never tells you. It just says, what do you want to use? SDA1, SDA2, SDA3 or what? And I'm like, yep. no, I can't do this. And I can't go into Gparted and check because it's a terminal. So, you know, there's, there's stuff that I've, I've got to have. Um, but going back to the problem solving, yes, me finally understanding partitioning. And I thought, yes, no more, uh, no more muck ups, no more ruining my windows. Uh, famous last words. I've still done it because you just don't think and bosh away you go. But I don't, I don't think I'm a sob, I'm a problem solver. Yeah. Because I don't have that mindset to do so. I can tell you what's wrong. And I can tell you that it doesn't work here for me. And I can probably suggest very simple solutions as to why it doesn't work. But I can't, I can't write a bug report and say, I did this because this happened and that happened. And I think you need to change this file to represent that. I just, I just can't do it. So I'll help people with testing it, but don't expect in-depth results from me you'll just get simple no that didn't work <laughs> next oh, i tried it in a terminal and it says this i don't know what this means but you're more than like you're more than welcome to have the the output so yeah i don't solve problems i i, <laughs> I tend to present them and go there you go fix it all right so we talked about the community what would you say the best source for information for people wanting to learn Linux is, is it YouTube? Is it forums? Is it the arch wiki? Which would you send people to? Um, especially nowadays I'd have to go with YouTube. Yeah. It's what, it's what the kids are doing. They're going on Instagram. They're going on Twitter. They're going on Facebook. They're watching videos. So YouTube, um, I am not and never have been and never will be somebody who can go to a manual or a wiki page, read it and understand it. Yeah. I have to physically do it myself or watch somebody do it multiple times. And YouTube is great for that. Yep. I can take it at my own pace. And if need be, I can watch it over and over and over and over until it eventually sinks in. So, but that, well, but we're going to get hate mail for sending people to YouTube to learn Linux. But I would agree with you because everybody learns differently. Mm. Some people will be able to learn from the ArchWiki. The ArchWiki is probably the one of the most in-depth things out there uh, yep. and with awesome information. But you also have to be able to learn that way. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. not everybody does. Forums are great if that's the way you communicate with people. But again, watching it, watching somebody else do it visually is very helpful for a lot of people who learn things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And although the majority of the times you're right, it would be YouTube. 
But if I had a friend who was you know, particularly clever or technical, yeah, I'd send him to the Arts Wiki or I'd send him into the forums or I'd send him somewhere else. But for your average Joe, sorry, Joe, if you're not average, YouTube. <laughs> All right. So again, not everything is awesome. Uh, the com Linux community is the best thing about Linux, but how have you found the Linux community to be over the years, maybe from starting out in the middle and then maybe at the end, has it been toxic? Has it been friendly? What has been your experience with the Linux community? I'm guessing right at the beginning, it depended upon what distro I was on, because uh, around about the same time, I was on Kubuntu and I was on uh, PC Linux OS. Um, no disrespect to everybody who loves PC Linux OS, but I would not recommend trying to get any information out of the forums. It just, for me, wasn't a good experience. Kubuntu, however, was awesome. Um and again, I coined a little phrase that talks about, oh, why is Linux so complicated? Oh, wait, Kubuntu's here. All is forgiven. Because it was great. It worked and the community was great. Yep. Um, and in general, I'm happy to say that I find it very friendly. Um, but in all walks of life, there are idiots. And there are spiteful idiots. Um and as I've already said, I'm not really a deep thinker, but I'm also fickle. So contemplate this, yeah? The Dalai Lama said, be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. And if you think about that, he's 100% right. Because if you haven't got something nice to say, don't say it. You're only fulfilling your own self-desire to hurt somebody by saying something nasty. Um, and again, back from when I was on the old point-to-point -point community, there was some awful toxic people around there. So part of my signature was be nice or be somewhere else because there's no need. Um, there's no need to be horrible to people. And I'm still struggling to to achieve that. But I think I've got better as I've got older. Well, it, I mean, it is everywhere. And that is an awesome slogan because, you know, a kind word to somebody is all it takes to bring on a great conversation. And it's, it, again, as you said, it's not necessary to be the other way. It's just not. So mm -hmm. what do you think we as a community can do to make that experience better as a whole? Stop think before you answer. Um, if somebody says to you, oh, I can't install Arch, it's hard, don't come back and say, well, it's easy, I can do it in 20 minutes. Because they might not think like you. Don't forget you're on this invisible forum. You're sitting there typing text out in Telegram. You don't know what physical di disabilities they have. You don't know um, whether they've only got two fingers for typing and not 10. You just don't know the type of co person you're conversing with. So you're never going to get away from those horrible people. And thankfully, it's only that minority. But we can all make that initial effort to stop reread the question that someone's asked and then put it in a positive light. So, okay. I don't find it as difficult. So what, what's your problem? Because I can do it in 20 minutes. So where do you stumble? What's, what's your limiting factor? And you can ask them in a nice way and then perhaps help them, help them get over whatever difficulties there is. But I, I go back to be nice or be somewhere else. All right, so let's take a snapshot of your collective thoughts on Linux right now. Give me one thing you love about Linux and one thing you hate, or maybe hate such a strong word, how about dislike? Give me one thing you mm -hmm. dislike about Linux. I love the community. It's awesome. Um, people overuse words in the English language, um, and I try not to do that. And one of my favorite words to use is awesome go and look it up look at every aspect of where awesome is used 
and that applies to the community. It's fantastic. What do I dislike? Regression in software. <laughs> it's working. Somebody brings out a new release. It's not working. Why? <laughs> Did you not test it? Did you not think that it doesn't work on someone else's laptop? So yeah, for me, the biggest thing that I would, um, the biggest thing I dislike is regression. All right. Does that, uh, does that answer my next question? That would be, if you could change one thing about Linux, what would it be? Um, more volunteers to do testing. And the more volunteers you have doing the testing, the less regression there would be. So it's a really difficult one because you've got that lone guy who's producing this piece of software and he's got his piece of kit and his latest version works. It comes to me and I go, oh, really? Well, if I use it that often, why didn't I say to him, look, okay, I'm not fantastic, but I've got all this different kit here. Let me help you test it. So we can all do something. I think if everybody thinks about what they dislike the most, we can all do something to make that dislike better. And for me, yep. testing would be the one. I think everybody in the Linux community can contribute in some way, whether that's monetarily, whether that's testing, whether that's just support, whether that's just talking to people. Mm -hmm. know, I think everybody can do something. Yeah. And it was really interesting because we were speaking to somebody last night and they said, even receiving a simple email that says, hey, I use Catfish. Thank you. It's great. Lifts the day. Um, and that reminds me of when I used to work in a help desk on IT and I've been uh, on the telephones in customer services. I don't know a single department that does not have thank you letter of the day or thank you email of the week. One simple word of kindness can lift you out of the doldrums. Agreed. All right. So where do you think Linux as a whole is headed uh, in the grand scheme of things? Are we headed to like we always joke about the year of the Linux desktop or are we headed to Linux desktop is going to go away? We're all going to be using Chromebooks. So here we go with the deep thinking stuff again. Um, and, and I'm not, as I said before, I'm not really a deep thinker, but Linux on the server will continue to be dominant. Um, I think it will start to dominate, if it's not already, the IoT of things. So your fridge will be Linux. Your, um, your iron will be Linux. Your forward-facing toilet row holder will be Linux. And it will say, oh, you've only got three wipes left. You need to order some more, more toilet paper. Um, but let's be honest, it's never going to be used by the masses on the desktop. Um, and it isn't going to be the year of the Linux desktop overnight. Now, for that to happen, we need to convince the large local computer stores to stock PCs and laptops with Linux on them. And that's not going to happen until we become more popular. And yet we're not going to become more popular until that happens. Anyone want a game of Catch-22? Well, you just hit it on the nail on the head. It's just like the whole gaming aspect that could propel Linux into the year of the desktop. But in order for that to happen, the game manufacturers would have to have their games run on Linux. They're not going to have their games run on Linux if people don't buy their games. If people don't buy their games, they're not going to have their programs run on Linux. It's just this constant thing that you have to... It's very frustrating, but I think the one way we do it is through our strongest point, which is the community mm -hmm. and just everybody talking about their favorite things about Linux rather than the things that don't work, you know, rather than the negatives of this is terrible. This is bad. How about we talk to people about what's positive, about what's awesome about Linux and its community. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Definitely. All right. So thinking of all, now this question comes from a very smart man. So thinking of all the reasons you chose to use Linux, do they still apply today? And do you reevaluate that position often? So for me, 
yes, they still apply today. Um, nothing has changed my mind there. But that's not to say that something might come along in the future to take me away from Linux, back to Windows, or wherever. And you never know, there might even be a usable, usable version of BSD one day. Who knows? Um, anything can happen given the time. Um, and there you go. I said a long way to go. My bad. Let me apologize to all those people who love and develop BSD. It's just not for me. Um, and I said I've still got a long way to go before I stop making. And sometimes people can think, oh, I'll say that because it's smart. I'll say that because it's funny. Um, and that was one, one of those statements. Did I have to pick out on BSD? No, I could have left it as you never know something else might, might, might come along. Um, I can't come up with do I reevaluate it all the time? Because I'm constantly changing distros and I'm constantly going back to Windows to help my family. So I guess I don't deliberately make a decision to reevaluate, but I'm reevaluating it all, all the time in the background. Right. All right. Is there anything else you want to share with people? There is. Um, and it's aimed back at your good self. Okay. Um, I cannot come up with enough superlatives to express how much I admire you and what you've done for the Linux community. Um, your YouTube videos, starting Destination Linux back in the day with Rob, um, and now Big Daddy Linux Live. What an awesome community of people that you have brought together. Um, and I do not exaggerate when I state that this is my highlight of the week. Thank you, Rocco. Well, thank you, Zeb, because it's each and every one of you guys that make up this community. That is awesome. All right. How can people get in touch with you if they want to, Zeb? Um, you can find me on the Telegram groups. So I am uh, a member, an active member of the Big Daddy Linux Live Telegram, and I'm sure you'll provide them with a link. Um, I'm obviously an active member of Destination Linux. Um, and you can get me at zebedee.boss at gmail.com. Um, that's out there more than enough now to not worry about. And I've got a very good spam filter, so I don't think you can uh, start sending nonsense through. Um, and you can generally find me on, on people's live YouTube channels. I'm there with English Bob. I'm there with Ghosty when he does them. And I'm there with um, Pseudo Reboot. So, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly easy to find and get in touch with. That's also one of the best things because we have such a large YouTube community that has live streams almost every day that mm -hmm. you can join in with. So, yep. All right. That wraps up our discussion with my friend, Zebedee Boss, Robert Wood. Thank you so much, Zeb, for joining us. Been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us this week as we spotlight the best thing about Linux, our community. Until next time, long live Linux. Community question. Mm -hmm. Toilet paper, up or down? Over, before I had over or under? <laughs> over or under, yeah. Okay, so before I had a new bathroom built, I was definitely an over person. And it used to drive me crazy if I went into somebody's bathroom and there it was hanging at the back of the wall. But now with my new bathroom, if it hangs over, it's in the way. So it has to hang under, back. I think cat yeah. people will probably say in the back. Under. Mm. Because, you know, they'll be going on. Bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> No, mine is purely aesthetics because when you sit down, it's you're banging your knee against it, so it goes at the back. All right. So where, so where did that question come from? <laughs> What's that got to do with Linux? How your toilet paper hangs? Oh my gosh, I'm going to cut that out. But <laughs> no, 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 leave it. I think it's fantastic. Well, it threw me for a minute, which is why I sat there going toilet paper. That was pretty good.